As its name suggested, Half-Life 2 Episode 1 was the first step in a planned trilogy of smaller games that would continue the Half-Life story. And by the time it was released, work on Half-Life 2 Episode 2 was already well underway. Valve worked on Episode 1 and Episode 2 simultaneously in order to maintain continuity for the story and aligned gameplay goals. It also allowed them to seamlessly address gameplay issues that players had with Episode 1, and integrate the updated Source Engine capabilities they made for that game. The build of Source used for Episode 2 has even more technical improvements, adding features like motion blur, a soft particle system, and more advanced AI. Valve would not just be releasing Episode 2 for the PC, but also for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 as part of the Orange Box collection. Though the PS3 port was handled by EA UK, who later became EA Bright Light, known primarily for their work on the Harry Potter games. While Valve is primarily a PC game company, they have not been averse to console releases, as they okayed the PS2 port of Half-Life and ported Half-Life 2 to the original Xbox in 2005. This was unique, however, in that the 360 and PS3 ports would release around the same time as the PC launch, instead of being ported a year or more later. Half-Life 2 Episode 2 launched on the PC and Xbox 360 on October 10th, 2007, with the PS3 version releasing in December. While it was initially designed to be the second episode in a trilogy, it would ultimately stand as the last official Half-Life title until the announcement of Half-Life Alex earlier this year. How does Episode 2 hold up as the unintentional final game in the Half-Life 2 saga? Let's conclude the Half-Life series retrospective and find out. Half-Life 2 Episode 2 opens with the aftermath of the train crash that ended Episode 1, with Gordon trapped in the wreckage. Alex frees Gordon and tells him that they need to meet up with Eli and Kleiner at White Forest, an old missile silo that the Resistance is using to launch a rocket. They're launching the rocket in order to seal the Combine super portal that formed as a result of the Citadel's destruction, which will allow the Combine to travel between realms en masse. It's also highly unstable, creating portal storms that deliver devastating shockwaves, which is also how Zen aliens were able to enter our dimension following the Black Mesa disaster. Alex contacts White Forest, informing Eli and Kleiner about the data they stole from the Citadel. And Dr. Magnuson, the leader of White Forest and another former Black Mesa employee, urges them to get to the base as quickly as possible. Alex and Gordon start their journey towards White Forest, but they're ambushed by a Combine hunter, who gravely injures Alex and traps Gordon underneath some rubble. Thankfully, a Vortigaunt rescues Gordon, and after calling for other Vortigaunts to help heal Alex, the two set out towards an abandoned mine. There he defends the Vortigaunt from antlions while he tends to Alex, and eventually a group of Vortigaunts comes to lend a hand, though they need antlion larval extracts to fully heal her. Gordon and his Vortigaunt friend travel into the underground antlion nest to retrieve the extract, where they encounter the antlion guardian. A beefed up antlion guard that seeks to protect the young antlions known as antlion grubs. Gordon and the Vortigaunt find the extract and bring it back to Alex, and the Vortigaunts begin their healing ritual. But before they finish, Gordon hears a familiar voice. Dr. Freeman. The G-Man enters Gordon's mind in order to talk to him, now that the Vortigaunts are too busy dealing with Alex to prevent him from meddling with events. It's here that the G-Man reveals that he was responsible for saving Alex from the Resonance Cascade, and that he did so against the wishes of others involved. The G-Man then tells Alex to relay a message to Eli, prepare for unforeseen consequences. His task finished, the G-Man leaves and the Vortigaunts finish their ritual, saving Alex's life. Gordon and Alex leave the mine and travel to a ruined Resistance outpost to recover a vehicle that will help them get to White Forest quickly. After dealing with more Combine hunters at a radio station, they discover a crashed Combine advisor pod, and they attempt to cut off its life support. But before it dies, the advisor demonstrates its telekinetic abilities and its life-sucking proboscis, and once the creature finally dies, it alerts the Combine to their presence. Thankfully, they escape, allowing them to travel onward to White Forest, reuniting with Dog right outside the White Forest gates. Inside, they meet up with Eli and Kleiner, as well as Magnuson, who's quite a cheery fellow. Oh, what next in a parade of constant interruptions? Unfortunately, the Combine attempt to breach the base, and Gordon is tasked with closing a missile silo to cut off their assault. 
Afterwards, Gordon and the Resistance examine the transmission from Dr. Mossman, and Kleiner discovers another set of data inside her message. The data contains images of the Borealis, a research vessel owned by Black Mesa competitor Aperture Science that disappeared sometime before the resonance cascade occurred. Apparently, Aperture was working on a huge project on the Borealis, but in trying to beat Black Mesa for funding, the team ignored safety protocols and the ship vanished without a trace. Kleiner wants to use the ship against the Combine, but Eli says the ship should be destroyed, with Alex and Gordon volunteering to investigate the coordinates that Mossman sent over. However, Alex unconsciously communicates the G-Man's message to Eli, which comes as such a shock that it causes him to collapse. Eli confides to Gordon that the G-Man said those same words to him right before the Resonance Cascade, and that he's aware that the G-Man is responsible for saving Alex's life. He's angry that the G-Man is continuing to manipulate his daughter, but before he can discuss anything further, Magnuson pulls Gordon aside to assist him with an imminent Combine attack. The Combine send a wave of Striders towards White Forest, and thanks to the explosive Magnuson device, Gordon and the Resistance stop the Combine before they reach the base. With the Combine dealt with, Magnuson launches the rocket, and it successfully manages to close the Super Portal, completely cutting the Combine off. Gordon, Alex, and Eli head over to the helicopter Gordon and Alex will use to travel to the Borealis, but as they're about to leave, they're attacked by two Combine advisors. Gordon and Alex are pinned up against the wall, and they're forced to watch as the advisors kill Eli, though Dog intervenes before they can kill Gordon and Alex. And the game ends with Alex cradling her father's body, sobbing uncontrollably. Episode 2's story is definitely the most complex of the series, bringing in new characters and concepts as well as both answering some long-standing questions and introducing a lot more. The basic plot is another get-to-this-location-as-fast-as-you-can story, but you're doing so to combat the major threat to the world, not just for your own personal safety as in Episode 1. It's also good to see that Valve put more thought into their characters, in particular the addition of Magnuson and fixing their voice acting problem. Dr. Magnuson is a bitter and cocky character, constantly demeaning other characters while praising his own efforts. Which is such a stark contrast to the rest of the major cast, who all get along well with each other that it makes Magnuson stand out for the better. Valve also recognized the problem with NPCs who shared the same voice actor talking to one another, so they brought on Adam Baldwin to do voice work for some of the NPCs whose voice is distinct enough from John Patrick Lowry to solve the issue, though to his credit, Lowry's performance is more dynamic here as well. Don, listen to him, Doc. We're on edge because this place is riddled with antlions. The board says as long as we don't step on their grubs, they shouldn't hear us this far from the nest. Episode 2 also has some of the best set pieces in the franchise, ramping up the intensity and length of scripted sequences and combat sections. The scenes are much larger and therefore have a much bigger impact, which makes the plot much more exciting to sit through. However, the biggest strength of Episode 2's narrative is its focus on adding several layers and mysteries onto the Half-Life mythos, particularly regarding the G-Man. More than any other game in the series, Episode 2 makes you ponder the question, who exactly is the G-Man and what are the reasons behind his actions? We've mostly seen the G-Man in a passive role, but we also know that he has immense power, and it's all but confirmed that he's responsible for setting the events of the series in motion. We see that directly in Episode 2, as the G-Man confirms that he saved Alex from Black Mesa, despite the objections he faced from those around him. The Combine invasion was likely his intention behind the Resonance Cascade, but he doesn't appear to be on the Combine's side, since he wouldn't send Gordon out against them if he was. He has abilities far beyond that of the average human and an interest in shaping the world around him, but how much of his influence is his own doing rather than that of a higher power? The G-Man has mentioned his employers in the past, and they may be the true progenitor behind the Residence Cascade, but the G-Man apparently isn't above acting on his own accord. We have no frame of reference for who or what these employers are, and the G-Man could be lying to Gordon's face, simply referring to employers to deflect his actions away from himself, tricking Gordon into thinking that he's not the one pulling the strings. We also learn that Eli had direct contact with the G-Man prior to the Resonance Cascade, though he takes no pleasure in having done so. Eli says that he had the power to abort the test that led to the Resonance Cascade, but either because of the G-Man's influence or a lack of forethought, he didn't. 
He knows that the G-Man is responsible for Alex making it out of Black Mesa alive, but he also knows that the G-Man had his own reasons for doing so. Which is likely referring to Alex's role in the Resistance and as a companion to Gordon. But even without considering the G-Man's role in the story, Episode 2's narrative is, in my opinion, the best in the series. It leans heavily into the emotional connection between the characters, in particular Alex and Eli, and leaves just enough space for character growth without distracting from the gameplay. The stakes feel much larger in Episode 2, not just because you face up against bigger and meaner Combine threats than ever before, but also because we've spent so much time with these characters that we want them to survive. That's part of what makes the ending so heartbreaking, because it's a genuinely shocking and demoralizing moment that happens right after you've experienced a significant victory. Though the other reason why it's so impactful is because it was the final Half-Life scene that players had for 12 years. While some storytelling problems from Half-Life 2 do carry over, Episode 2 delivers another solid story through masterfully crafted storytelling techniques. I've praised Half-Life's simple narrative design as a way to subtly inform the player of a larger story, but for the story that the Half-Life 2 saga wanted to tell, Episode 2 does it the best. Not only has the story been refined to its highest form, but the gameplay has also been improved in numerous ways to deliver a top-notch game. You'll once again be traveling with a companion for the majority of the adventure, though it isn't as much of a focus as it was in Episode 1. Not only will you continue to fight alongside Alex, but you'll also spend time with a Vortigaunt companion who can shoot electrical energy at foes. This attack takes time to charge up, but it stuns antlions, allowing you to go in for the final blow. Episode 2 finally gives the flashlight its own separate energy meter, meaning that you can still light up dark areas even if you're sprinting heavily. Valve made this change because playtesters couldn't outrun the Antlion Guardian while also illuminating the dark area, and while they don't justify the change in the story, I still appreciate it. The game also introduces some new enemies, the first being the Antlion Workers, antlions that shoot acid that drains most of your health, like the Poison Head Crab in Half-Life 2. They're plentiful in dark caves, and when they die, they explode in a blast of acid, so it's wiser to fight them from a distance even with their ranged attack. The Antlion Guardian shares similar traits, and barring its poisonous capabilities, it's more or less just an Antlion Guard with a bioluminescent skin that looks pretty cool, honestly. The Guardian protects Antlion Grubs, these little bugs nested in and around Antlion Caves. They can't hurt Gordon, but if you squish them, they'll dispense small morsels of health, and it's strangely and unfortunately satisfying to kill these little guys. The most noteworthy enemy is the Combine Hunter, and they do not mess around. Their main attack is shooting flechettes that pack a wallop if they hit you, but if a flechette hits a solid object, it explodes after a while, which deals damage if you're in the blast radius. They can also ram and slash you if you get close, and if you encounter more than one of them, they fight you as a pack, using flanking tactics and never keeping their distance. Hunters are resistant to firearms, but they have a weakness to objects launched with the gravity gun and will likely die instantly if you run them over with your car. So you have plenty of options for hurting them even without the use of bullets. While there aren't any new weapons that Gordon can add to his inventory, he'll need to use the Magnuson device to take down Striders during the final battle. You launch these devices with the gravity gun and they'll stick onto a Strider's body, and once you shoot it with another weapon, the Strider will instantly be destroyed. This Strider battle is awesome, by the way, as Gordon needs to defeat several Striders before they reach White Forest while also dealing with Hunters. It's the perfect climax to a game that continuously ramps up the intensity and difficulty of encounters, and is one of the best moments of the entire series. Valve updated the Source engine to add a cinematic physics system, which allowed for the designers to create more realistic physics-based scripted events. A system that Valve uses in full effect to demonstrate complex destruction sequences and make the numerous set pieces stand out, leading to some amazing spectacles. Half-Life's game design has always centered around combat encounters coming in waves, with the action rising and sinking in intervals to keep the player engaged. But for Episode 2, those waves are slower, with longer periods of both uptime and downtime. Since fights typically last longer, they naturally feel more intense, and Valve also improved the enemy AI to make these sequences more challenging. The AI isn't necessarily more difficult, but Combine Soldiers and Hunters will adjust their combat strategy based on the player's actions, so the combat is more dynamic. 
This blends well with the map design, as maps have more open space and are overall bigger, allowing for larger set pieces and combat sequences. Maps in Half-Life 2 and Episode 1 felt claustrophobic, trapping you in hallways and tight spaces during combat while not having so many enemies out that the player feels overwhelmed. Episode 2 opens the maps up to allow for more freedom of movement, but this is counterbalanced by the heightened combat difficulty. The maps are still fairly linear, but there are more branching paths and side areas that make these locations more fun and rewarding to explore. It also helps make the driving sections less aggravating, because Valve brought back the car gameplay after it was absent in Episode 1. Thankfully, driving is more tolerable thanks to the maps being less cluttered and having flatter geometry. That doesn't mess with the controls as much. Not only are the areas different in their construction, but their look is distinct as well. Episode 2 makes a larger attempt to diversify its environments, which helps it flourish on its own visual identity. The game almost entirely eschews traveling indoors, with the only significant interior location being White Forest, which manages to stick out with its Cold War bunker aesthetic. The rest of the adventure takes place in sprawling forest environments and deep underground caverns, which blends well with the map design. These areas mark a nice change of pace compared to Half-Life 2 and Episode 1's urban environments while still keeping it close to the aesthetic style of the series. Episode 2's locations are much cleaner and flourishing, as you travel through areas that the Combine haven't completely taken over. So rather than a mixture of Eastern European landscapes and sci-fi construction, Episode 2 features natural environments almost untouched by the events happening around them. The soundtrack, however, continues the same style that Kelly Bailey worked with in Half-Life 2. Much like Episode 1, there's a mixture of ambient pieces for slower scenes or emotional moments and Electronica-inspired rock tunes for action sequences. And overall, the soundtrack is more enjoyable than Episode 1's, doing a better job keeping each song distinct from one another while adhering to the Half-Life style. Bailey's approach to creating the Half-Life soundtrack definitely evolved over the series, and Episode 2 represents what I think is the most Half-Life soundtrack. I still prefer Half-Life 2's music, but Episode 2's is a close second, and again, the soundtrack is used more sparingly, giving the rest of the audio design room to breathe. Half-Life 2 Episode 2 once again takes the formula that Valve established in Half-Life and built upon in Half-Life 2 and refines it into its most polished form yet. The gameplay improvements are minor, yet provide a fine-tuned experience that proves that even after seven full games, Half-Life's game design never gets old. Plus, the open maps give players a degree of freedom not yet seen in the series without giving them so much that it strays away from what makes Half-Life unique. Even though it's only about half the length of Half-Life 2, it still manages to feel like a large, substantial, and satisfying game. I do think Episode 2 is sometimes misjudged because in the years following its release, it's been labeled the finale of the series by default, which I think puts it in an unfair position. If you look at Episode 2 as the last Half-Life game, of course it's gonna fall short, as the story sets up so much that won't be followed up on, and though it concludes its own plot well, it bears the responsibility of acting as the unintended final game, and it doesn't feel like one. But not only does it have some of the best plot points and gameplay segments in the franchise, it makes perhaps the best use of Half-Life 2's design. And with the addition of the Combine Hunters and the improved combat, playing through Episode 2 is definitely a worthy experience. While players enjoyed Episode 2, they were also excited for what would happen in Half-Life 2 Episode 3, but that is a story in and of itself. Valve confirmed that Episode 3 was in development in 2007, but Valve was quiet about divulging details in the following years. Fans expected that the game would deal with Gordon and Alex investigating the Borealis and eventually destroying the Combine. And leaked concept art from the episode showed Gordon confronting Combine advisors by the Borealis in what appeared to be an Arctic setting. However, very little information came to light regarding the game, and Valve and Gabe Newell continuously refused to comment on when Episode 3 would launch. 
In 2011, Gabe Newell stated that Valve was done with episodic content, as they had shifted their focus to games-as-a-service releases, which many took as an indication that Valve was planning something bigger for the next Half-Life game, potentially developing a full-fledged Half-Life 3. But that was merely a rumor, and through the 2010s, fans kept asking Valve to give them some form of communication regarding the episode, which they did not reciprocate. By 2017, almost all serious hope of Half-Life 3 had died off, and if the years of waiting hadn't killed it, then what series writer Mark Laidlaw released that year did. On August 25th, 2017, Laidlaw released Epistle 3, a thinly veiled Half-Life fanfic that, while never addressed as such, is seen as an unofficial transcript of the plot of Episode 3. The story changes character names and swaps their genders, but there are several direct connections to the plot of the Half-Life saga. The release of Epistle 3, combined with Laidlaw leaving the company and Valve's continued silence, was seen as a death knell for any future Half-Life game. At least from Valve. After Episode 2's release, there were two Half-Life projects being worked on outside the company that were eventually cancelled. One was Return to Ravenholm, also known as Half-Life 2 Episode 4, which was being developed by Arcane Studios, who would later go on to create Dishonored and Prey. Very little is known about this title, though some art rumored to be from the project has surfaced. As you'd expect, it would have taken place in Ravenholm and would have a focus on zombies and headcrabs, and Valve cancelled it because they felt that the ideas weren't creative enough. The other title was helmed by Junction Point Studios, led by veteran designer Warren Spector. We don't know a lot about this game either, but one concept that was conceived was a magnet gun, though the specifics on how exactly it worked aren't clear. Work on this project ended as Valve transitioned away from episodic content and Junction Point Studios was bought by Disney, which led to the studio developing Epic Mickey. But what about Valve? According to Valve programmer Robin Walker, the company was working on numerous iterations of Half-Life 3, but by 2011, development had halted. There's likely two reasons why it was cancelled, personnel issues and a lack of innovation. Valve's corporate structure doesn't assign employees to specific teams, instead shifting them around to different projects as necessary. As Valve produced more content for Team Fortress 2, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and Defense of the Ancient 2, they'd logically need more resources for those games, which would make it more difficult for work on Half-Life 3 to progress. And even if Valve was making serious headway in development, knowing how Valve designs Half-Life games, it's possible it wasn't meeting their standards. Valve has always approached Half-Life games with the mindset of innovating the first-person shooter genre and building upon the foundation that was laid out before them. While they had done that with Half-Life and the Half-Life 2 trilogy, it's reasonable that Valve just couldn't create enough inventive mechanics or design principles to justify the game. If Valve wanted to wow their audience, they would need to break the boundary not just through game design, but through technology, and in 2020, that's exactly what Valve is planning to do. On November 18th, 2019, Valve announced Half-Life Alex, a brand new Half-Life VR title, and three days later, they released a trailer showing off the story and gameplay. The game will take place before Half-Life 2, and players will take control of Alex Vance working alongside Eli and the Resistance to deal with the fledgling Combine threat in City 17. Rather than just being a VR tech demo, this is a 10 plus hour game with its own story and characters, and will take heavy advantage of virtual reality technology. Players will be able to use their hands to interact with the environment, pick up and throw objects, open doors, and aim weapons freely. That all may seem like basic stuff, but VR is still in its infancy as a product, and it needs a killer app to demonstrate what VR can do, and Half-Life Alex definitely looks like it could do the job. I know a lot of people are upset that Half-Life Alex is VR exclusive, but as I said, Valve is a company based around reinventing the wheel. I think that VR is a perfect medium for the Half-Life franchise to evolve, exploring ways to add to the narrative while providing an entertaining game for longtime Half-Life fans. Plus, based on the features Valve has implemented, it'd take a lot of time to rework the game into a form that could be played on a computer with a traditional setup and it likely wouldn't be worth the effort to create a watered-down version of the game that sacrifices major aspects of what it is. But Half-Life Alex also represents something far greater, something that fans have been waiting to see for over a decade. It represents the fact that Valve is no longer neglecting its signature franchise, and is an indication that change is coming to the company. 
In the latter half of the 2010s, Valve continuously dashed the hopes and expectations of fans in both direct and indirect ways. Updates to Team Fortress 2 dropped significantly in both quality and frequency. Franchises like Left 4 Dead and Portal were seemingly abandoned altogether, and the announcement of their Dota 2 card game artifact was met with heavy disdain. But more importantly, there was a lack of communication between Valve and their fanbase regarding what was happening at the company. Valve listens to user input extensively, gathering data from the feedback they receive from players and using that to make changes or plan future content. And it seems like the pressure to please their fans led to Valve keeping communication to a minimum to prevent players from getting upset. Now with Half-Life Alex's announcement, we have some hope that things will turn around. Just the fact that Valve is even building up the game at all is incredible, as Valve apparently initially wanted to just put the game up on Steam with no fanfare. The reception the trailer received shows why that approach wouldn't have worked, as more than anything, Half-Life Alex is an attempt to patch up relationships between Valve and its users. Valve generated a large amount of mistrust in the gaming community, and though Half-Life Alex doesn't erase what they've done, it's a good first step towards forgiveness. While whether or not Half-Life Alex will be worth the wait remains to be seen, we can look back on the series that came before it and continue to appreciate its legacy. Half-Life's influence on video games has been well documented, and you don't need me to tell you how great of an impact it had. But beyond that, the Half-Life series has such an incredible attention to detail in both its storytelling and game design that it deserves to be admired. Just looking at the games at their core, they're fundamentally solid first-person shooters with expertly designed levels, beautiful world building, and intelligent emotional storytelling. And it's no wonder why fans have wanted the franchise to return for so long. The future of Half-Life was grim for years, and every Half-Life fan knows the agony of waiting for news about the series, but with Half-Life Alex on the way, there's finally a light in the darkness. It isn't exactly the Half-Life 3 fans were looking for, and the long-term future of the franchise is dependent on how Half-Life Alex performs, according to Valve. But after 12 years, it's amazing to see that the series that captured the hearts of so many people will finally have life breathed into it again.